Hello and welcome. Today we're going to talk for a little about the infratemporal fossa. Infratemporal fossa. Now the important thing before we start is this is the infratemporal fossa, not the temporal fossa. The temporal fossa, which many people confuse, is the area more near towards the temple of the skull where the temporalis muscle is, whereas the infratemporal fossa sits below this area and uh, is a key part of where all the structures associated with uh, an inferior alveolar nerve block are related. So the infratemporal fossa is a region below the base of the skull, below the skull, and it has some key features in it such as uh, muscles and in fact about 90% of the actual volume of the infratemporal fossa is filled with muscles including the medial and lateral pterygoid muscles which are first pharyngeal arch derived muscles and the other key features of it are branches of the mandibular division of the trigeminal nerve, the third division of the trigeminal nerve and lastly branches of the maxillary artery and these all occur within the infratemporal fossa. So let's have a look at a skull and have a look where the infratemporal fossa actually is. And the infratemporal fossa is sort of this is bounded by this sort of area here and it has uh, at its, and obviously the skull is upside down here, we can see the palate over here and frame and magnum here. And this area here at the base of the skull is actually the greater wing of the sphenoid. So the roof of the infratemporal fossa is sphenoid bone. And actually if you look very closely you can see one of the key features that we'll talk about later being foramen ovale sitting in the roof of the infratemporal fossa. The lateral wall of the infratemporal fossa is actually the ramus of the mandible. So the lateral wall is equal to the ramus of the mandible. And obviously there's a uh, infratemporal fossa on the left and the right side. I just haven't drawn it over here, but you can imagine it here as well. Basically where this spring is holding the mandible on. And if you think about this surface of the ramus of the mandible, another key feature important to dentistry sits in that area there. It sits actually just about there, which is the mandibular foramen. So the inferior alveolar nerve is going to make its journey from the foramen ovale here down to the mandibular foramen there. The medial wall of the infratemporal fossa really is a tricky thing to, to understand. The first thing I want to draw in here is really this is the pharynx here. So this is actually the very top of the pharynx. So this is full of air. This is actually the nasopharynx here. We'll just put an N a P for nasopharynx in there. So the medial wall of the infratemporal fossa is this part of the pharynx here. So let's just write medial here. Medial equals pharynx. And clearly that's true on the left and right side because uh, you'd see the medial wall here of the, is the other side of the pharynx. So when you actually look into someone's mouth and you look past their mouth, you are actually, and you look sort of to the side where you see the, the tonsil sitting, that is actually the medial wall of the infratemporal fossa. And we have one surface of this infratemporal fossa to go, and that is the floor. I'm just going to sneak it in here, the floor. And the floor, there is actually no floor to it, but for the purposes of anatomical regions, what we say is it's the lower border of the mandible is deemed to be the floor. So sort of a plane running through here, sort of across this way, is deemed to be the floor of this region. 
So to give you an idea of the volume of this region, this region is really about the size of a sort of thickened thumb in, in volume. And as I said, 90% of this is taken up by muscle. And we'll talk about that in a minute, what muscles they are. So this is the infratemporal fossa. Why is it so important to dentists? Well, it's really important to dental personnel, dental professionals, because when you give local anaesthetic, in particular an inferior alveolar nerve block, you are actually pushing the needle through this temp infratemporal fossa like that and aiming to target the uh, mandibular foramen right here. So it's a critical area where we are um, anatomically fiddling around. Let's have another view of this region on a different skull. Here we are. We are now looking from the uh, posterior view. We're sort of standing in the vertebra looking forward at this skull. And what you can see here is the back of the nasal cavity here. That's the nasal cavity there. And we can see the palate down here. And here's for our friend Foramen Magnum up here. And we are actually looking at the sort of rear view of the infratemporal fossa. And in fact, it's sort of the roof of the infratemporal fossa is this region right here. And the reason I show this view is to highlight to you that uh, the vast majority of this area is filled with muscle. And the most prolific muscle in the region is the muscle that runs down here like this, down onto the angle of the mandible on the medial surface here. And this is the medial pterygoid muscle. Just out of interest, in the old days it was called the internal masseter muscle because it runs in exactly the same pathway as the masseter muscle does on the outside. Now the important thing to notice is where it's attaching to. The medial pterygoid muscle attaches into this pterygoid plate. And if we look on this side we can actually see, and I'll use a little bit of red pen and outline its attachment. It attaches into that deep part of the fossa there and on this medial surface here of the lateral pterygoid plate. Now you have to be a little bit careful here because your immediate reaction is because it's called the medial pterygoid muscle we would assume it's attached to the medial pterygoid plate when in fact to be clear it doesn't. No muscle attaches to the medial pterygoid plate only the only muscle attachments are to the lateral pterygoid plate and you can see that the medial actually means the medial surface of the lateral pterygoid plate. So it's, the, it's that surface that's important to where this muscle attaches onto the medial, onto the medial surface, the lateral pterygoid plate, right there. And the other feature that we can uh, highlight on here is our friend, the uh, inferior alveolar nerve that would run from up there, down there, like that. It runs from foramen ovale. Remember, that's where the mandibular division of trigeminal exits through. It exits through foramen ovale to produce a couple of major branches that are important to us. The inferior alveolar nerve, and that's the one we can see in yellow here. And the other one we'll just do in light blue is the lingual nerve. And in fact, the lingual nerve also runs down through infratemporal fossa right down there, right adjacent to right adjacent to the inferior alveolar nerve. In fact, this distance here, this distance between these two nerves here, is really only two or three millimetres. So they are very close together, these two nerves. And, and that's good because what it means is when you give an inferior alveolar nerve block, 
often the solution will actually affect the lingual nerve in this infratemporal fossa. What I want to do now is go on and talk about the last part of this story. If we go back up here and look at our list and check off what we've seen and talked about, we've talked about the medial pterygoid muscle, we've talked about the key branches of the mandibular division that run through the infratemporal fossa, being the inferior alveolar nerve, and its neighbour, the lingual nerve. And what we're left to, to talk about is really the maxillary artery. I'm not going to talk about the lateral pterygoid muscle in this talk. We'll do a separate talk on the muscles of mastication and cover it there. So let's go on now and talk about the maxillary division, the maxillary artery and its pathway through the infratemporal fossa. As I said, the last part of this story about the infratemporal fossa is actually to do with the, ma the maxillary artery. And this is a very significant artery that uh, supplies most of the structures of the face, including all the teeth and oral structures, except for things around the floor of the mouth. So let's have a look at where this happens. Here we have a skull to look at. The important thing to remember is the external carotid artery, a major branch running up the head, runs right behind the mandible just in this region here, as it comes right down from the neck. It, at its very terminal, it branches into two branches. One branch runs up here, across the skull like this, and spread, spreads out over here, and it's called the superficial temporal artery. But that's not the one we're interested in. The one we're interested in heads straight in here and is called the maxillary artery. And it is the larger of the two terminal branches of this external carotid artery. And in a separate video, we'll talk actually about all the branches of the external carotid artery. But for now, let's focus on this maxillary artery that's going to head directly medial from here. And just to be clear, all of this branching, this terminal branching, all of this area here, is actually covered and embedded in a salivary gland, the parotid gland. I'll just write it here. And the parotid salivary gland is covers up where this final branching actually happens. And if you remember from your previous anatomy experience, the little duct of the parotid gland is opens in that little lump next to your upper sixes and sevens across there. And that drains the salivary flow. But let's get back to talking about this uh, maxillary artery as it dives in from here. Now I've got another picture of a skull up here that actually helps you see where it runs from. Now if I just remind you that that, uh, that, that branching of the maxillary artery happens just back here, just off the picture slightly, and uh, it will run across here and it runs almost directly across into where this little wooden pointer is in here. And that is on the medial surface of the infratemporal fossa. And can you see this fissure sitting just here like that? It's a little tiny gap there. And that fissure is between the back of the maxilla here. That is the back of the maxilla. And this so this little edge just here is the lateral pterygoid plate. So this fissure, this little gap between them, is called the pterygo... I'll write it down here, shall we? It's called the pterygo-maxillary 
fissure. And that is where the maxillary artery targets towards as it runs across the infratemporal fossa. There it is there. Popping out just there to join in. And then remember that back here is our friend the external carotid artery. It runs down there. And that other terminal branch will run up there like that between the superficial temporal. Now on its journey across the infratemporal fossa, the maxillary artery sends off a whole bunch of branches. And those branches go off and supply critical structures. But the most important set of branches in this region, because remembering running out of foramen ovale right there and running down here like this, and I'm just going to dot it in, oops, dot it in as it goes down here to end up at the mandibular foramen, is our friends the inferior alveolar nerve and the lingual, uh, inferior alveolar nerve and the lingual nerve. And they are both branches, remember, of the mandibular division of the trigeminal nerve. And what happens is the maxillary artery sends branches to follow all of the branches of the mandibular division of trigeminal nerve. And that's described in a separate video. So wherever a branch of the mandibular division goes, a branch of the maxillary artery follows. So that's a very simple rule to remember all the branches of the maxillary artery as they come off on the imni infratemporal fossa. So for example there will be an inferior alveolar artery and there will be a lingual artery. In fact there are two lingual arteries so it's a bit of a complicated story. So that's what happens to the maxillary artery as it runs across the infratemporal fossa.